This is the fourth and last episode of No School Station, a mini-series by Studium Generale and the Art Education as Critical Tactics team of Artes. So welcome back to No School Station, where we share our views and reflections on the idea of no school. A creative space in which students and teachers are part of a community of learners, working together in a constant process of co-creation. We want to inspire and inform you on that idea, but we also invite you to think along. And this is our last episode, and it's titled No School, Yes Learning. And yes learning indeed, because learning in all of its forms has been at the center of every episode of our mini-series. And we also want to end with it. So this is our goodbye, and it consists of exploring different ideas and spaces for learning, sometimes unconventional and sometimes deinstitutionalized, always keeping in mind the connection and the relation to the main actor within the learning process, aka the learner. First up is Nishan Shah, Director of Research and Outreach and Professor of Aesthetics and Culture of Technology at Artes. In his contribution, Nishan talks about the relationship between learning and the learner in a different environment, such as the digital one. What is, in fact, the role of the learner in a no-school approach to education? My primary focus has been in spaces of online learning. And the thing that has been the most challenging in that space is to figure out the role of the learner. The problem with the learner when it comes to digital learning is that the default role available is that of the user, right? So the user is at the basis of all the Web 2.0 buzzwords. Um, Participation, connection, collaboration, sharing, engagement, virality, circulation. All these different engagements require us to install not just a technology on our devices, but it's also installing a person who can understand and work with these technologies. So when you think about installing the learner as a user, what you get is a Disneyfied idea of the user. A user who is defined only by the engagement with the technology in a closed cybernetic loop, uh, and it flattens all the historical inequities of class, gender, sexuality, race, or religion. So all users in a digital learning environment are the same users. And I want to argue that we need to look closer at the making of the user, and especially the learner as a user. Because historically and technologically, it's not a happy process, and it's definitely not a benign one. Let me illustrate this making of the user and the user as a learner through two historical stories of creating learnership, which have nothing to do with the digital as yet, but are obviously the... Uh, antecedents of how we understand the learner in digital and technologized spaces. And let me begin with India. So in 1835, Thomas Babington Macaulay, who was the Governor General of India, in a document titled The Minutes on Education, argued, and I'm quoting, that a single shelf of a good European library was worth the whole native literatures of India and Arabia. Right. So in the process, he ends up creating Um, what is called Macaulay's Bastards, sometimes I think it's people like me, uh, who were produced as the good gentrified learners of the empire, intelligible to the European sensibility and way of thinking. And in order for someone like me to be produced, Macaulay did not just bring in the great literatures from England to India and teach us foreign tongues. No, he began the creation of the user and the learner through two other structures, the ledger and the Indian Penal Code. The ledger keepers uh, were the accountants, not the philosophers. Uh, They were the first bearers of knowledge of the British East India Company. They were responsible for counting the wealth of the British Empire, but they also had to learn how to be counted by the British, right? A measure so that they could be accepted into the system as legitimate learners. And as the ledger keepers were taught to count and account the resources of the empire, They were also trained to present themselves as accountable and countable, trained to become the Pakka Sahib. In order for the heathen to be then transformed into this honorable British man, 
Macaulay produced the Indian Penal Code that obsessively sought to regulate the orgiastic practices of the native. He formulated the Unnatural Sexual Acts Law, which criminalized all sexual acts except for those penal vaginal intercourses that were intended for procreation. It also produced a series of guidelines on how to curb the homoerotic excesses of the Indian native, one of which was to create boundaries in closed spaces, not allowing for the unclean male bodies to touch each other and thus succumbing to the temptation of the flesh. Um, these boundaries became the blueprint of office design because they dictated how much space must be maintained between two men in a close working environment so that they can concentrate on their work, restrain their libidinal desires, and resist the urge to break into song, dance, and sodomy. Because it was only once the native was taught to count and be counted, to compute and be computed, once the native was trained to understand the penal implications of his penile desires, that the native could understand the value of literature and the power of poetry that invited him to um, wander lonely as a cloud and chance upon a host of daffodils. And yet we know that when it comes to learning, the learner is actually a hugely irrational, emotional and a libidinal actor. And this is not just a romanticism of the human subject in all its glorified perversion. We have seen the idea of the libidinal and the perverse in different learning experiments. Take the story of John C. Lilly, right? So uh, in the 1950s, he built a dolphinarium, a house that was half land, half water. And he put a bottle-nosed dolphin named Peter with a female animal behavior scientist named Margaret Howe to simulate conjugal domesticity in an attempt to achieve interspecies communication, um, getting ready for the day that we have to talk to aliens. In her meticulous diaries, Margaret Howe recounts how Peter was forming affective and emotional bonds as they cohabited and she taught him human language. However, this affection was taking an amorous turn. Peter was refusing to mate with other female dolphins who were made available to him in a separate water tank and was entering into physical demonstrations of desire with Margaret. How, a slight woman, was afraid that Peter, what he saw as playful encounters like biting, butting her, rubbing against her, might actually physically hurt her. However, when she pointed this out to John Lilly and the other scientists, they actually asked her to take matters in her own hands, asking her to masturbate Peter as a way of establishing a cybernetic feedback loop where the dirty work had to be done outside and beyond the confines of the interfaces and recordings of that experiment. The BBC recently made a documentary on how uh, of the woman who slept with dolphins and she talks about how these intense and unusual encounters with Peter uh, broke her heart because after she left the experiment, she worried the most about the fact that Peter was never going to know where she had disappeared and she had no way of communicating for him, that she cared for him, just not in the way he wanted. The story of Margaret and Peter is illustrative of the irrational and libidinal excesses and tropes of learning. The learner as this innocent, measured subject is a complete farce. And it's also illustrative of the gendered and patriarchal structure that often makes the educators and teachers perform invisible and exploitative labor that's hidden and remains unacknowledged because it doesn't fit into the contours of a teacher training manual. I want to suggest then that at least within the digital learning environments, a no-school approach would be to refuse the idea of the learner as a user. Learning begins when the idea of this gentrified, controlled and disciplined user is rejected. We need to think about a theory of learners and then of course of learning that accepts the flawed, libidinal, transgressive and emotional aspects of learning. And one that recognizes the feminized, invisible and racially charged material practices of teaching that get flattened behind the seductive visualizations and spectacles of our digital devices.
Next, we have our curator, Fabiola Camuti, reading the contribution that was sent to us by Selma Jonkers and Jeannie Kaathoven. Selma and Jeannie are pioneers in the field of innovation and creativity at the Vocational Creative School St. Lucas. And they are also co-founders of Vonk, named after the Dutch word for spark. Both of them are hybrid tutors. They have their own creative studios as well. And it was the spark between them that was the beginning of Vonk, an experimental educational concept connected to no school. Vonk is a result of their experiences and beliefs. Designer Esther Matthijsen, who is also part of Vonk, will also join the conversation, telling us about her role as a creative learner. Here is a practical experience about unconventional spaces for learning. Let's start with the belief that school is life. Vonk is a collective where living, learning and working are intertwined. We dream, dare and do. We work together apart, autonomous and connected. We challenge our creativity and love to work on positive changes. During our nomadic creative life, it became clear that the heart of Vonk also needs a home, a safe base to reconnect, to cook and eat together and let new initiatives originate. In the near future, our home will be part of a vibrant creative community, a hybrid learning environment with all kinds of possibilities to pop up and plug in. From this base, everyone flies out into the world, guided by where they add value. Along the way, coaching is customized, because what matters is personal. Learning starts with knowing what your sense of urgency is. Working on your Ikigai makes you wonder, In what way are your passion, mission, vocation and profession connected also to the world around you? A holistic view helps to clarify that. We embrace creativity as a personal journey and encourage magnetism, coincidence and intuitive decisions. What or who makes you curious and why? We dare students to make new connections in an organic way and so new perspectives and experiments will arise naturally. But first of all, learning starts with confidence. Funk is about freedom and taking responsibility for your own learning every day. We experience that connections based on confidence are essential to create learning opportunities. Philip Tochi emphasizes this also in the model for high impact learning that lasts. Like Tom and David Kelly from the global design company IDEO, We believe that creativity is like a muscle that can be trained. A way of thinking and doing that requires effort and sincere attention. More creative confidence makes it possible to feel more comfortable in uncertain situations, which open new perspectives for learning and innovation. A question we ask ourselves, why do we accept uncertainty? In order to survive as nomadic creatives, specific skills and attitudes are required you have to accept that the only certainty is uncertainty. Besides working on a growth mindset, being courageous, curious, empathic, being able to improvise and having sincere interest in your environment are core essential needs. Developing your talents requires adaptability, not to be discouraged by unknown situations and the ability to learn about new possible aspects. You have to reinvent yourself again and again. These are the most important skills for the future, as Yuval Noah Harari tells in his book 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. One last thing that is very important in Funk's pedagogy, don't forget to play and have fun. And to get to know something more about this, Esther will join us to tell us about her experience as creative learner in Funk. There are certain people who like to spend their energy on doing what they love who are concerned with what's going on in the world and crave a deeper understanding. Jani and Selma are the ones who came up with initiatives at St. Lucas to bring these types of people in contact with each other. Vonk was a result of these encounters. Creating the branding for Vonk became my graduation project. And today, a few years after that, this turned out to be an ongoing adventure. 
an adventure that's about investing in something and someone else without worrying about what you will get out of it. I could never know beforehand when I started working with Funk what this experience would give me. And I have no idea which other directions this will take. I only know that I'm having fun doing it right now and I look forward to what is yet to come. This quarantine has a positive side. I have now an unthinkable amount of time to create. And I'm embracing it. From a distance, we're now working together on expanding Vong's vision and visuals. I'm starting to learn to allow the pleasure in the making process again and slowly, this no longer feels like work anymore. Only now I'm beginning to accept that you have to be patient. Not patient as in waiting passively, but patient while being focused. Only when you have been attentive towards something for long enough, only then you can reach the point of playing with it again. Creating without pretension. It's not a final destination, but a state of mind you have to keep searching for and that you also have to keep training. It's about constantly finding the balance between what you love doing the most and the fact that, that, the fact that this also has become your job. While in the meantime, life blows through both aspects. Sometimes, life gets in the way. But that friction can also lead you to your drive, if you make room for it and if you carefully determine your attitude towards it. And if you have found a place you can trust, it's definitely worth investing your time and attention in it. The place does not have to be location bound. The place is about the people with whom you surround yourself with and with whom you feel comfortable. In that place you not only support each other, but you also grow as a person. That way the investment pays for itself and it remains worthwhile contributing to it. That's what funk means to me right now. As with all of our episodes, we want to end this last one on a piece of music. That way, we make creation a part of reflecting and the sharing of those reflections a starting point for learning. The music for this episode is created by our curator, Cassandra Onk. Cassandra is a singer, music theater maker, and of course, a member of the Art Education as Critical Tactics team. This last week, Cassandra has been recording several vocal improvisations in which she sang about her personal learning experiences and how they shaped her view on education. She used those improvisations to create a new piece of music that finds itself somewhere in between a song and a monologue. Her contribution is called I Remember Learning. I remember I was six. In the garden with my mum I just came home from school Put pencil to paper for the first time As I learned how to write the word I Never felt more proud in my life I remember I was ten When my dad took me outside he gave me ropes, told me to hold on tight He taught me how to fly a kite I remember five years later Flying my kite, fully solo When it got stuck high in a tree and I had to learn how to let go Lessons are everywhere And learning is in our DNA Trying to hold it, constrain it, confine it It all seems silly to me The most important things in life you can't control I'm still learning every day how to let go. The world may change my
my hope remains we all are learning side by side some may take the lead for a while as long as we breed we'll keep on learning and that's it for no school station for now in this short journey we have opened up a window onto the world of no school in the first episode, we discussed the urgency of a change in the educational system. The second showed us the importance of the magnetic power of education and whether this lies in the school building or in the educational community. In the third episode, we were inspired to learn and create in a nomadic way, in times in which our schools, our homes for learning, are closed. And in this last episode, we found out that learning can be an unconventional process and that the role of the learner is not just that of a passive knowledge receiver, but that it can and maybe should be an active, transgressive, and emotional one. And now it's up to you to think along with us. Please send your ideas to our curators. You can find their email addresses in the show notes. Those curators are Fabio Lacamuti and Cassandra Onk from the Critical Tactics team. They put together the whole of this four-part series, which was edited by Joke Alkema of Studio Generale Artes and produced and hosted by me, Dennis Schaans. Our theme music is by Mauro Casarini. So for one last time, thank you for listening. Stay safe, stay inside, stay connected. <laughs>